We've talked about cause and effect, two things that go hand in hand. Light, for instance, is an effect, and the sun is the cause. If we come across a book or an article, there's a sense in which it's an effect. And if we trace it back to its source, we find an author who wrote the book in the first place. Clearly, our universe is an ordered universe, but is our habit of tracing effects back to their sources useful when it comes to something as vast as our universe? Have you ever thought of our universe as an effect, something that points back to the source? After all, many of the signs are there. Order, arrangement, and specific laws are signs that the universe and our world aren't just here because of some cosmic accident. Show that they're here for a reason, and that reason went into their making in the first place. We're joined now by Professor John Lennox. Dr. Lennox, thanks for being here with us. It's a pleasure. And we've been looking at the issue of tracing an effect back to its cause, and the scientific process of doing that. Is it fair to do the same thing with the universe and try and look at what caused all this around us? I think it's completely fair. Indeed, it would be very surprising if science were to fascinate itself with causes and effects within the universe and not ask what about the whole show? Is there a cause behind it? And of course that's a very famous question in philosophy. Why is there something rather than nothing? Now of course many of my atheist friends just say the universe is a brute fact. We have to accept it because they cannot get behind that. But I find most scientists are not satisfied with it. For instance, Stephen Hawking with Larry Mlodinoff in the recent book, The Grand Design, in which he purports to answer this question, why is there something rather than nothing? But I was fascinated in reading it because what he eventually says is, because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Now, I find that a very strange statement as a scientist for several reasons. First of all, he says there is a law of gravity, and then he says the universe creates itself from nothing, which is a contradiction. But leaving that aside, the next thing, and the very serious thing is, a law of nature cannot create anything. And it can't even cause anything. For instance, Newton's laws of motion never set a snooker ball moving in the entire history of the universe. And Stephen Hawking in this book, fascinatingly, his first example of a law is the sun rising in the east and setting in the west. That's a law, it's a regularity that we observe. But does that cause the sun to move? Of course not. Does it create the sun? Of course not. So in fact, he hasn't answered the question at all. And so what I come back to is this that ultimately when we face this question, the answer that's been given for centuries by the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that's still by far the best answer and science cannot really comment on it. Now, why does there have to be a cause deeper than, you know, the time plus matter plus chance that we so often hear? Uh, why can't that be the cause for the universe? Well, of course, if we say it's time plus matter plus chance, we are saying that this causes something. And uh, clearly things happen over time. But time plus matter plus chance means you're already presupposing that the matter exists. And the point is, where do you get the stuff from? There has to be a, a cause at the end that creates this universe like that. But I think behind that question, there is a deeper question. And that has to do with the nature of the universe that we find here. Clearly, certain things granted that we have the matter, though we don't know where it comes from, but we'll accept that for the moment. Time plus matter plus chance will do something. But what I do not believe it can do is to produce the sort of order and complexity that we find in the universe. Can you explain a little bit more on the idea of order and the importance of order and what that means for this whole discussion? Yes, I can. If you stand on this mountain and you saw the letters of your name written in the snow, you would immediately infer that whatever machinery had been used to write that, that there's an intelligence behind it. 
Now, exactly the same, when we see the 3.4 billion letters, exactly in the right order, like a computer program, knock one or two out and change them, maybe okay, but usually not, then the immediate thing to do is to infer that there is an intelligence behind it. And I'm puzzled, you see, why scientists aren't prepared to go there. Of course, I know why they're not prepared to go there, because the atheist philosophy demands that there must be a bottom-up explanation solely in terms of time plus matter plus chance. But it won't work because of the nature of the order we're seeing, especially the language-type order we see in DNA. Now, there are some who will grant us, okay, we might say that God created the universe, but then he stepped back. He wound the clock, so to speak, and then just let it go on its own. But the traditional Christian view says that God did not step back and he is a very personal creator and he's involved with his creation. Why is that such a important distinction? Well, that view is called deism. And of course, it's a big move and an advance on atheism. The late, very famous English professor of philosophy, Anthony Flew, who was an ardent atheist all his life, he became a deist at the end of his life. Why? Because of the complexity of DNA we've just been talking about. But you're absolutely right. Christianity goes much further and says that God is not a force. He's a person. It's very dangerous to look at God as a force, of course, because we being persons are superior to forces. We use forces. And it's very dangerous to begin to think that we can use God as some kind of spiritual electricity. But the Christian revelation gets us much further than what we can learn from looking at the universe around. Looking at this world around us, we see evidence of intelligence, we see evidence of design, we see evidence of power. But then, think for a moment, you and I are persons. Now, if we imagine that our origin is less than personal, we're actually flying in the face of virtually all that we know. But above and beyond that, the central Christian claim is that God became human. God is a person. He became human in Jesus Christ. And that's the central. Of course, it's, it's supernatural. It's a vast miracle, the biggest one that ever happened. So that when we look at Christ, we're seeing someone who claimed to be God. Now, I know that's a fantastic claim and it needs to be examined for its validity, but I believe it to be true because he rose from the dead and he proved his credentials. But now once we've got that, of course, we can see that God is personal. And then we can talk in terms of categories of love and of a relationship and all this kind of thing. Now, if I could ask you about another argument that people will say, they claim that, you know, these processes are so complicated that it's a lazy view to just attribute it to God. We don't want to have to try and figure out the answer, so it's easy to just say, God did it. What do you say to that? What you're saying, Nathan, this is the idea of the God of the gaps. I can't explain it, therefore God did it. I'm very sensitive to that, you know, as a scientist. I don't want to be accused of that. And it's such an important question to answer because I do not believe in a God of the gaps. I believe God is the God of the whole show. Now, sometimes people accuse me of believing a God in the gaps, that I usually tell them the story of Isaac Newton. You know, when he discovered the law of gravity, he didn't say, ah, I used to think God did that, but now I realize that gravity does it, so I don't need God anymore. No, but what he did was he wrote the most famous book in the history of science, the Principia Mathematica, in the hope that it would persuade a thinking person to believe in God. You see, what's going on here is quite important. Newton didn't make the mistake that I feel people like Richard Dawkins and Stephen Hawking are making. That is to confuse two kinds of explanation. Confusing on the one hand law and mechanism, and on the other hand, personal agency. Just imagine that sitting on this mountain we had a Ford Galaxy motor car. And I say to you, I'm going to give you two explanations from which you choose. The one explanation of this Ford car is the laws of internal combustion and mechanical engineering. The other is Henry Ford. Please choose. Well, you can see that that's absurd because it's not an either or. 
They're different kinds of explanations, actually. One is in terms of mechanism and law. The other is in terms of an agent, Henry Ford, who invented and designed the car. And you need both to give a full explanation. The one is scientific, the other is a personal explanation. And so the work of scientists in elucidating the universe and discovering its laws of gravity and the inner workings of the atom, that says nothing to deny the fact that there is a creator that invented those laws and made the universe. In fact, the more we discover, the more evidence it is of his creatorial hand. And that's the exact opposite of a god of the gaps, as you can see. Well, finally, I'd like to ask you about the Genesis account. Now, in the very beginning, we're told that God created the heavens and the earth. Um, but it doesn't necessarily tell us a lot. Even in those few words, there's so much that is unsaid. So what can we learn from the Genesis account? I think we can learn a great deal. Actually, the basic thing is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, people really don't notice that, although it was wonderful hearing it read from space, from Apollo 8 on Christmas Eve all those years ago, and I was glued to it. But think about it. We accept now as almost self-evident that there was a beginning to space-time. But in the 1960s, when I was a student, no, no. The evidence was just coming in scientifically that there was a beginning to space-time. Now, here's the interesting thing. It was fiercely resisted by some of the best brains, certainly in my country. And the editor of Nature at the time, Sir John Maddox, wrote an editorial saying, look, we can't go down this road. We can't start entertaining the idea that there's a beginning to space-time because it'll give too much leverage to people who believe the Bible. So here's a scientific advance for which Arno Penzias, amongst others, got the Nobel Prize. A scientific advance being resisted by scientists because they thought it would support the Bible. The Bible and science coincide on that. Genesis tells us rather remarkably that, when you think about it, that God did not create everything at once. There was a start, there was a sequence of days when of stages when God spoke and God said and God said and then that sequence finished. Whenever you see a sequence you say where is it going? Genesis tells you it's going to human beings who are uniquely made in the image of God. In other words what it's saying if you step back from it is the universe, the earth, is being specially tailored so that you can have life on it. Now let's change my hat to a scientific hat. What does science say? In the last 40, 50 years, it's told us how special this Earth is. Now, we know it's special. If we were any nearer to the sun than we are standing here, carbon-based life would be impossible because of the heat. If we were any further away, it would be impossible because of the cold. If the Earth spun faster, you and I would get a free trip into space, but there'd be no atmosphere anyway for us to breathe. If it spun slower, we'd boil to death in the day and freeze to death at night. Now, that's interesting, but when it comes to the study of the standard model of the universe, it becomes fascinating. Because, for instance, Paul Davis says that some of these fundamental forces of nature have to be balanced so accurately that it's like taking a gun and shooting at a one-inch square target at the far end of the visible universe and hitting it. And his response to that is, the impression of design is overwhelming. Now, what's that say? Genesis says there were stages leading to God creating human beings in his image. Science says the universe is fine-tuned to have life on it. That's a convergence, but the biggest convergence of all has to wait for the end, and it's this. And God said, and God said, and God said. Now, in the New Testament, in the fourth gospel, John starts by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through Him, and without Him, nothing came to be that came to be. So what is it saying that in the beginning, God the Word, and in Genesis, in its simple but very profound language, you're getting and God said, and God said. In other words, how do you get from one stage to the next? By a random unguided process? No. And God said, and God said. 
in the beginning was the Word. So if we step back from that now, Nathan, finally, and look at this, here are two worldviews we're facing. One says the universe is a brute fact. In the beginning were the particles. And they arrange themselves somehow into galaxies, stars, and the Earth, and it produced life by self-organization, and eventually produced human life, mind, and the idea of God, because there isn't a God. Or we start in the beginning was the word. And then mass energy, instead of being primary, as in the atheistic view, they are derivative. So you have a choice between two. And that's where the great debate is today, in the academy and everywhere else. It's between those two worldviews, the one that starts with matter and energy and ends up with intelligence and word and the other which starts with word and intelligence and mass energy or derivative and as a scientist i know which one i think is telling the truth <laughs> well, thank you very much dr lennox it's my pleasure